Good morning, Anita. Hi, good afternoon from Latvia. <laughs> yeah. Um, Anita, how do you like your name to be pronounced? Anita or Anita? It doesn't matter. Honestly, whatever someone else is comfortable with, I'll answer to both. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you... Anita is traditional Latvian pronunciation, but in New Zealand, Anita was stressed on the second syllable. Right, and you just revealed both by your pronunciation and also by saying it that you are from New Zealand and also that you are in Latvia. Tell me about it more or tell my audience about it more. How did it happen that a New Zealander ended up being in Latvia? Okay, well, like many other Latvian families, my family left in the 1940s. Uh, my father and his parents arrived in New Zealand in 1951. He met my mother, a first generation New Zealander, and they had me. Um, we, we grew up in quite a Latvian household. The language was spoken around me every day, but not to me because nobody thought Latvia would be free again. They thought Latvia was, Latvian was a dying language. Um, so I was brought up only speaking English. I didn't start having Latvian lessons until I was, I think, in my mid-40s. Um, so that, that's made it a bit difficult. But my first ever visit to Latvia as a tourist, when I had to get on the plane to go back to New Zealand, I felt very much like I was leaving home instead of returning home. Um, I felt like I connected with this place, like I really belonged. Um, some years later, there was a, a big natural disaster in the city in which I lived that uh, caused a lot of damage to our home. And I kind of fell out of love with living in New Zealand and um, thought, well, Latvia would be a good place to go. So <laughs> we bought one-way tickets. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Yeah. No regrets. <laughs> Latvia <laughs> would be a good place to go. So how, if I were to ask you, how do you feel right now? Do you feel like a Latvian? you feel like a New Zealander or anything, anyone in between? Um, actually, the other day, um, a friend was driving me to the shop and she turned to me and she said, you know, you just look like you've always been here. And I was quite overcome with emotion when she said that. And, and my response was that I, I feel like I've always been here. I, I feel comfortable in my skin. I feel so right here in a way that I never felt right before. And I think um, actually wherever I go, there is an assumption that I speak fluent Latvian until I open my mouth and I'm a big <laughs> Kiwi disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and also I found that most people well, a lot younger than me and younger than that speak fluent English or they want to practice their English with me and they won't speak Latvian with me so um, there's not quite the opportunity I thought there would be here to speak Latvian. You just answered uh, how you are perceived but how do you feel? I feel relaxed, happy, comfortable. Um, I think some people may find that hard to imagine because there is a war about a thousand kilometers from where I'm sitting right now. Um, but I, I think if you don't have hope and faith, what have you got? Hmm. Yeah. How long have you been there already? Uh, it's nearly three years since arriving in Latvia, but we lived in Riga for a few months as a, a base, really, from which to look around. Um, my grandfather and great-grandparents are buried not that far from where I am now. Um, 
my grandmother was from a town just south of here, my father from 80 or 90 kilometres northeast of here. I, I don't think I'd visited here as a tourist before. So the first time I came here was actually to look at a property for sale. And I caught the bus from Riga. And as we entered Leopaya city limits, I could feel something in the air. It was, it was kind of crackling with electricity. And coincidentally, it would have been my father's, my late father's birthday that day. Um, so maybe I felt his excitement and joy. I don't know. But arriving here, I felt that there was a a relaxed energy, but also a very industrious one. And I've met a lot of people who are working very hard to preserve and restore and renovate this city because it had a massive population decline over the last 30 or so years. So there are a lot of old buildings just sitting empty, but there's so much um, positivity and enthusiasm for, for making this town the, the best place it can be. And I love being part of that. And uh, when you are saying we, I heard the noises <laughs> around <laughs> you. So tell me more who you are living with there. And okay, I was, hoping the, <laughs> I was hoping the microphone wouldn't pick up on that. <laughs> are you keeping anybody <laughs> captive? <laughs> um, actually, yes, I am at the moment. Um <laughs> I'm in my sunroom right now with two cats who can't seem to find anywhere else to go at the moment. They, they're obviously enjoying sharing this space with me right now. <laughs> but you didn't fly from New Zealand uh, together with your cats, right? No, no. Um, I had said at some stage that, that my daughter could have cats again and we needed to find our permanent home. And we moved into this property Oh, it might have been, I think, a day or two before Christmas two years ago. And unbeknownst to my daughter, I had contacted the local animal rescue centre and I said, do you have any kittens that need a home? Because we would love to have them live with us. And, and the woman said, actually, we have three. And I said, oh, that would be wonderful. And on Christmas Eve, they dropped three kittens around. They just walked into my daughter's room with these cat cages and she just stood there with her mouth open saying is this a dream is this really happening so um yeah and sadly one passed away at a very young age of an illness we're not even sure what but luckily it wasn't contagious and the others are really happy and healthy um I just I've not lived without cats since I was about 19 or 20 and I just love the energy that they give a home what are the names of your cats Okay, um, my daughter named them. Mm. Um, one, the rescue place um, was describing the colour of the cat. They said there are two black ones and one looks like a tiger. And I thought, whatever does that mean? And it turns out tabby, but I told my daughter they described this cat as looking like a tiger. And she said, oh, maybe tiger lily. Or how about just lily? So we have a lily. And... She's also really into anime and cartoon characters and um, it's a world completely unfamiliar to me, but there is a character called, I think, Hatsu Miku. And so we have a cat called Miku as well. And the little one who passed away, she was very, very small and had like a curved little body and my daughter named her Bean. So we had Lily, Miku and Bean. I know that you have a story more than just that. And it is related with a name of one of your kittens. Yeah. Um, this little kitten was very, very special to us. And when she passed away at the vet clinic, I said to the vet, can we have her cremated and bring her home in a box? And the vet looked at me like I was crazy. No one does that here. And because it was Christmas, the ground was frozen solid. We couldn't even dig somewhere for her. Um, and I wanted to remember this little cat somehow, but I didn't know what to do. At the time, I was um, so 
excited by the things that were going on. And the apartment next to mine um, was just basically an empty shell. And the guy who was selling it made a comment to me that he was going to show someone around next week. And I, I'm not really sure what possessed me at the time, but I said to him, no, no, don't show them. I, I'll buy it. And I kind of thought, oh, what have I done? But I, I felt so much that I really wanted to own that apartment. And I, I thought, well, I can make this into a business. So I started renting out the apartment and it went really well for me. And I, I needed to have a company formed. And the only name, like, no matter how much brainstorming I did or talking to my daughter, the only name that we could come up with was Bean Group to honor little Bean. And I think the more I think about it, the more it's more than just a, a cat's name, it has so much meaning you know you, you plant a bean and then it grows and it can grow as big you know into anything you want and and I thought that kind of represented me like you know starting with the, the seed of something and not really knowing exactly how big it was going to get or in what direction it was going to grow but um starting my company has been one of the the best and most interesting and fulfilling things I've ever done in my life. That is amazing how little triggers can change our lives or or be the reason to, for us to make big decisions. Um, similarly to how, how you described, you just noticed an apartment and you decided to buy it. Uh, what happened with me once was when I was thinking about a car that I needed to buy a vehicle and I was actually thinking about uh, Toyota Tundra, which is a truck, because uh, uh, I like gardening, and I was thinking I would uh, have a bed where to carry tools around and flower pots and all that. But I <laughs> ended up buying something uh, totally different, <laughs> just because I saw mirrors of a new car um, that looked like the mirrors had diamonds <laughs> on them. <laughs> <laughs> you bought a car because the mirrors were shiny. <laughs> yes, they looked like they had diamonds, but then I justified it because it's hybrid, so it it runs on electricity and it charges itself. So I thought that I made a good decision. <laughs> Just like that, things happen. You did absolutely, yeah, yeah. So sometimes we um we can make decisions that that turn out to be really good just when we use our intuition we, we don't um rationalize or even write lists of pros and cons or anything it just feels right and when it feels right it generally turns out to be right it's that gut feeling and I've actually found since I moved here that I'm experiencing that more than ever before I think I'm just sort of open to ideas coming to me because I came here with a sort of a a blank slate of a life, you know, nowhere to live, nothing to do. So I had to fill in everything myself. And I've really enjoyed doing that. Um, like I said, I wasn't really going to do anything, but I got so excited by all the projects going on around me and um, how this town was regrowing and 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 getting more and more life in it. And, and I just thought I've got got to be part of that I've got to contribute in some way I can't just live this quiet little life and not not be involved in my new hometown right but uh, more about us uh, being women and just acting upon our emotion I had a feeling that you would be dressed in black <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was not wrong <laughs> so I wanted to match you and I wore something black. See? Oh, yeah. Black and white. Oh, thanks. Oh, <laughs> what I'm noticing is that you have dots <laughs> behind you. Yes. <laughs> they are red, though. So I have dots as well. So I don't know what that would lead us to in this conversation. <laughs> Maybe the colors and the, the role of colors in your life. And well... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much everything in my wardrobe is black. 
I I did try color a few years ago. I tried so hard for maybe a year or two and I wore blue and red and green and everything in between, but um, I never felt like me. I'm so comfortable in black. Everything matches. I never look, you know, like I'm not coordinated. It's not possible when everything is the same color. Um, the only thing is if you don't hang or fold everything properly, you can't find something you're looking for. Try looking for a black T-shirt and a big pile of fresh laundry. <laughs> but everything is black. It's really hard. Hey. But um, where I live, my apartment's very, um, oh, quite neutral, actually. White walls, a lot of natural wood, beams. It's got really high ceilings because we're in an attic um which in New Zealand if you said you lived in an attic you know someone would probably call the authorities and say there's a woman living in an attic it's terrible but here it's actually quite delightful <laughs> the ceiling is really high I've got great big windows um I'm raised up off the street a bit it's just it's a delight to live here um I've got a little bit of color the Ikea sofa behind me the red and white spotty sofa that's a big splash of color I, I love it. I don't actually have any black furniture. Um, the apartment next door to mine, as far as decorating, I was kind of guided by what was there already, that the walls get painted white anyway. Here it's called a white finish. And you can stop a renovation at that point and then you take over and you paint walls whatever colour you want. And I was asked what colour do you want? And I said, well, the white walls look amazing and all the wooden beams and things, they stand out so much and you can see the architecture of this beautiful attic space that has really uneven ceilings that dip really low and soar super high. Um, so I, I think I wanted to keep a light and bright holiday feel in the apartment next door and we're close to the sea. So it has the colours of... Um, maybe sea grass and sun and sand and water and sky. So there's a lot of blue and yellow, a bit of teal in there, quite um, and some white. So it it looks year round. It looks like a, a summer holiday place, but it's actually very very cozy. Even in winter, it's it's really warm. And finally, Anita, I can't help but ask you where. Where do you like to have your morning drinks or your evening drinks after you your long and tiring <laughs> okay. um, days? Two places. Always I have made coffee in the morning and I will drink it looking out my kitchen window. Wherever I lived in New Zealand and in Latvia, I like to have my coffee. I have one perfect little ristretto in the morning. I go and stand at my kitchen window and I look out onto the street and the old building across the road and it's gone in a couple of sips, but it's, you know, one of the most enjoyable parts of my day. And then at the end of the day, and this completely depends on the season, my favourite place to have a drink is on my terrace. It faces south, it gets a lot of sun. Um, I would like, um, I think, a mojito in the summer and in the winter a um hot red wine drink is quite nice even when it's snowing outside just just put on a warm coat and some snow boots and um hold this warm mug of wine and it's perfect yeah i have seen pictures and videos of you <laughs> being on your terrace but i was waiting for another word <laughs> you would use since you are a new zealander <laughs> um i'm just trying to think what it could be can you prompt me if you're like me you find it very hard to keep your dick dry i left my dick unprotected and it was warped out of shape in no time i could barely recognize my own dick imagine that Oh my goodness. <laughs> I would say that in New Zealand. I actually really would say that in New Zealand. Everyone in New Zealand likes their drinks on a deck. Um, but here in Latvia, a deck is a terrace. So, and if I said deck, no one would know what I meant. So they just start using the words that people here use. But yeah, I, I find sometimes people don't 
understand what I'm saying so clearly because I do have quite a Kiwi accent. Maybe not um, the most typical Kiwi accent, but it's still um, very rare in these parts to to find a Kiwi or find someone who speaks like me. So, um, yeah, I can be misunderstood a bit. I know that I can I uh, can ask these questions to you because we've uh, grown to become quite comfortable <laughs> with each other. Is there any question that you would like to ask to me to conclude this conversation or say anything to the audience? Um, my life's work now is to encourage people to come to Leopold. And whether you stay in my apartments or not, I would just love other people to experience this place. I'm hoping that you will come out here and stay. I would love that. Um, I, I just, I am so in love with this place. Every time I go out.